everybody. Um, please settle in. We'll get started in a minute here. Maybe we can get going. Um, thanks everybody for joining in today and great to see everybody here. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are Spark Mentoring and our goal here is to promote your holistic professional development through easy access to mentorship, career guidance and learning resources. Uh, we have several programs under our umbrella, ranging from uh, workshops to one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I won't go into too much detail, but you can check us uh, out at www.sparkmentoring.info. Uh, today's session is under the Inspire series, where we bring uh, young professional professionals pursuing careers in a diverse set of professions and share their insights and wisdom into those career paths so you can confidently set foot into those paths. And today's topic is on breaking convention, which as the title suggests, is trying to pursue a path uh, that is not perceived as normal. Um, and we asked all of you during registration if you would pursue uh, an unconventional path uh, yourself given a choice. And over 50% of you said yes, and about 44% of you were on the fence. And this is very representative of our conversations with several young professionals who, um, you know, these people are pursuing more and more uh, of the unconventional career paths, quote unquote, uh, because given how the uh, given the challenges of the world we're facing today, you know, like climate change, climate change, food insecurity, spread of misinformation, these unconventional paths are really how you can make a meaningful impact in the world through uh, your careers. But it can be scary to take the plunge uh, and move to a completely new field that you're not familiar with, which is why we thought it was so important to bring to you the stories of uh, two ICTNs who've gone on to pursue careers and fields that we don't normally think of. So we have with us today, Yutika and Aparna. Um, so Yutika got her uh, BTEC from uh, food, BTEC in foods uh, from ICT in Mumbai uh, in 2012. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Imperial College of London. And prior to that, pursued her PhD in management, focusing on strategy and entrepreneurship at the University of North Carolina. She also earned her MBA from Symbiosis International University, where she was selected for a dad funded dual degree program at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. And her areas of expertise include sustainability, social, environmental impact through business and qualitative research. So quite a few degrees there. Um, glad to have you here, Yotika. Next up, we have Aparna, who uh, graduated with her B Farm and then later her M Farm from Dr. Marian Degani's lab from ICT also. She currently works as a manager of scientific communications at Dyserna Pharmaceuticals in the US. Previously, she worked as a medical writer at the Integra Life Sciences in, um, in the US. And then uh, before that, she earned her PhD in medicinal chemistry, where her focus was on neuroscience. And she did that at the University of Toledo. And during her time there, she wrote for the U Toledo student newspaper, served as a graduate student representative on the college curriculum and diversity committees. So very impressive too. Um, and we're so glad to have both of you, Yutika and Aparna here, and we can't wait to hear about your stories. Before uh, jumping in to the uh, presentation, I just wanted to uh, get some quick housekeeping out of the way. Uh, this is going to be a roughly one hour session for the first 40 minutes, we'll hear from each of the speakers about their journey. And in the last 20 minutes, we'll uh, transition to the Q&A session. Um, we'll use Pigeonhole as the platform for the Q&A session. So uh, to post your questions, you can go to www.pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode 17JUL21. You can also use the QR code that is currently being displayed on the screen. Um, the page is live, so you can go ahead and post the questions as they come to you. You don't have to wait until the end of the session to post those. All right. And you can also probably see a, um, 
a, a link pop up in the chat if, um, if you can't um, use the QR code. All right, so that's about it from the from our end and I'll stop sharing my screen here and without further ado, let's get started uh, up and I'm going to hand over the stage to you now. Thank you, Anusha. All right. Hi, everyone. Let's get started in a little bit here. Okay. Can you guys see the full screen now? Awesome. Let's jump in. Hi, everyone. I am thrilled to see the bright and young faces at ICT today. And uh, it actually makes me nostalgic and takes me back to my old UD days. And I'm excited to share my story with you. So let's jump right in. Below you see a picture of me as a kid. Um, I used to love performing and I thought I'd be a dancer one day. Um, obviously that breaking of convention didn't happen. This is me today. And that's my husband, uh, Bharat. And we live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bharat and I went to UDCT together to get our bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences. He took the SUTIX route and uh, he's this awesome formulation scientist today. And we often argue about topics like what is the best scientific method to make a cup of chai? Uh, and in our free time, we love to uh, listen to and watch uh, stand-up comedy. And so my journey uh, to the United States started uh, from Bombay when I was accepted for pursuing my bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences at UDCT in 2003. And I was just introduced to this whole new world of pharmaceutical sciences uh, taught by some of the best in the field. One of my favorite top subjects right from the beginning was medicinal chemistry. So it's no surprise that when I decided to uh, pursue my master's in pharmaceutical sciences, it was in medicinal chemistry under Dr. Mariam Degani's guidance in her laboratory. That was my first ever practical experience of the scientific method. And I truly enjoyed it. And it was this very love for medicinal chemistry that led me to apply for a PhD in the United States. And I was accepted in the University of Toledo wherein I learned along with medicinal chemistry techniques or a lot of neuroscience and neuroscience pharmacological techniques. And um, so the research, my research project was focused on testing the effects of ashwagandha in ischemic stroke. And this involved me performing delicate brain surgery on mice. Um, and I also had to learn a lot of cell culture techniques, growing neuronal cells in petri plates um, and, uh, and some other molecular biological techniques. So on the one hand, I was honing in on my research skills. On the other hand, I was also introduced on ways to present my research. And this began on a smaller scale when I was presenting my research to my lab colleagues, to my mentor, and on a larger scale when I was putting together a manuscript for it to be published in a peer-reviewed journal. And the more I did that, I realized that I really, really, really enjoyed putting together that story of the science behind my work. And so I continue to continue to do more of it. I volunteered to write a review article and my mentor was kind enough to give me more and more opportunities. He asked me to write a book chapter along with him. And he also, I also helped him write research grants to get us funding for the lab. And I also helped out my lab colleagues when they were putting together their papers or presentations. Another thing I realized at this point is that volunteering to do all these things is one of the easiest ways you can figure out what you truly enjoy doing. And you can also test out the limit of your skills in these areas. So that's exactly what I did. I volunteered to be a graduate student ambassador and I uh, served as a graduate representative on the curriculum committee to learn how the curriculum of these courses are set up. And I had the opportunity to be the co-chair at a, a reg regional scientific conference, which brought together experts from the industry, students from different universities so that they could share their research. And towards the end of my PhD, I had already served as a student blogger on the College of Pharmacy website. And I had also contributed as a student columnist on um, our university newsletter called the Independent Collegian. So here I was wrapping up my PhD and finally after defense, I got my degree. 
but I still didn't know what I was going to do with my career. I had no idea. So naturally, I applied everywhere. And it was around this time that I got married as well. And I moved to Princeton, New Jersey. And I was applying for research scientist positions, for postdoctoral fellowships, and also a few medical writing positions. And like any first-time job seeker will tell you, that you've got to prepare yourself for a lot of rejection. And they started piling up very quickly. I must have made um, hundreds of applications, I think, most of them for research scientists, physicians, postdoctoral, and some for medical writing. And I was getting equally rejected from all directions. Until finally, one day it happened. I got my first ever interview call. And this was for a postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton University. And it, the interview went very well. I liked the professor of the lab and the work they were doing. And the professor liked my um, portfolio as well. And uh, I thought I was going to just get a, get a final decision. I was just waiting for that final call. Simultaneously, I was also interviewed for a postdoctoral position at Rutgers University. Same thing there. We reached the final stage. I was just waiting for that call to come back. And uh, while these things were still up in the air, um, one Thursday afternoon, I got this in phone interview for a medical writer position at this company called Integral Life Sciences. It was a medical device company that I had never heard of before. And I had no idea how I was going to prepare for this interview. And uh, so the interview happened. And to my surprise, I ended up uh, impressing the, my interviewer, um, who have, who, my future boss. And um, she asked me to come and take a look at uh, the, the place. So I went and checked it for real to see if this existed. And, and uh, they wanted me to start the very next Tuesday. And to this day, I don't know what led me to say yes to that, but I did. And that's my first ever job as medical writer at Integral Life Sciences. And I'm so glad I said yes to that. And uh, my boss, she's this wonderful lady. Um, and she gave me a big chance and she took a little bit of a risk with me because I was this complete novice to this field of medical writing and medical devices. And I reciprocated that by putting my everything into the job. And I grew tremendously, both as a person and as a professional during my tenure at Integral Life Sciences. Uh, I worked there for a little over five years. And uh, then COVID hit round about or March of last year is when I found my second job as uh, at Dysona Pharmaceuticals on their medical affairs team as a manager of scientific communications. And that's, a, that's where I work right now. And it's a truly exciting time to be at uh, Dysona. And that's my journey from Bombay to the United States and here in Massachusetts. Now, next I wanted to share with you um, to give you a good understanding of what I do every day, I wanted to start first with what medical writing really is. It is, simply put, it is the communication of scientific information that is tailored to the audience you're writing it for. And at its core, this communication must be accurate, unambiguous, and succinct. So when you're hired as a medical writer, it's typically by a pharmaceutical industry, or maybe biotech, medical device. And you could be working on different forms of medical writing. Let's say you're putting together a paper or a poster that's geared, geared toward more of a doctor or a physician audience who is looking to prescribe the drugs. Or you could be putting together a white paper or a brochure that is meant to educate patients and their family members on a particular disease. Regardless of what you're working on, these three core principles never change. So you might wonder what motivates me to do this every day. So what motivates me to go do my job every day other than the fact that I enjoy writing is the impact it creates. First and foremost, medical writers are the bearers of credible scientific voice in the community. And being that we are in the public health sector, we do our share to reduce the spread of misinformation out there. Second, I truly enjoy knowing that the work I do will ultimately improve the understanding of patients, will educate them of their options, and will allow them to be active participants in their own medical decisions. That is powerful. Third, 
we would not be able to place these life-saving drugs into the hands of patients if it were not approved for use, um, let's say by a regulatory agency like FDA. And medical writers play an important role there too. They help put together documents that demonstrate a drug's safety and efficacy that's required before you're approved to sell your drug in any country. So that's the impact and that's the why of what I do. Now, over these years, I have come to realize that my background in research has played such a major role in shaping me into the medical writer that I am today. And you'll see that wh why that is in a little bit. First and foremost, to be a, very, a good medical writer, you need to have interest in writing. And notice that I say interest, not talent, because talent alone is not enough. You need to want to be really good at it. The second important thing is that you need to be thinking scientifically in a scientific way. You need to be able to have the ability to critically analyze data and also to be skeptical of data until it proves to you otherwise. Medical writers are often required to be very quick learners because they're working on multiple areas, multiple therapeutic areas or disease states all at the same time. And they need to quickly get up to speed and gain enough knowledge so they can uh, understand the science behind it and question the science behind it. And hand in hand with that goes the interpretation and the presentation of the data. They need to be able to quickly change formats in which they present the data to suit the audience. And putting it all together is the ability to make deadlines, to manage multiple projects, making sure that you're always on time to submit your deliverables so that you need to be good project managers. And if you see a uh, background in uh, research gives you plenty of opportunities, plenty of time for you to figure out if you're truly in interested in writing. So that's taken care of. A research background also gives you all the necessary fundamentals for critical thinking. And to this day, uh, I thank my strong fundamentals built during my UD days for my critical thinking skills that I applied at work every day. And you'll also be given plenty of opportunities to present your data. You'll be presenting your data all the time when you are doing research to your lab colleagues, to your professor, to your thesis committee members. So that helps sharpen your presentation skills. And next, because you're running so many different experiments and you're often need to share lab equipment, lab resources, negotiate with people to meet your thesis deadline, you also get good project management skills. So if you go to C, you can take care of four or five attributes if you have a, a, a background in research. And so if you're truly interested in writing and you're pursuing research, know that you can make that leap into medical writing. That's not to say that it doesn't come with its own challenges. One of the biggest challenges that I've had to face is giving up on research. And you don't know how much you're gonna miss it until you give it up. And it's, it's, the being, it's being able to give control to someone else to perform the research. And it's also giving up the fact that you're not as part of the innovative part of science anymore, not a direct contributor at least. And it took me a while to realize this, that you do not have to do science to make an impact in science. And that helped. The second biggest challenge, which continues to be a challenge even today for me, is that medical writers are often being put in a position where they're being the arbitrator of multiple opinions surrounding them. And uh, let's say you're putting together a manuscript and you will get so many viewpoints of looking at the same data. And it is your job to balance all those opinions. And these are often conflicting. So you'll be, you, you need to be able to resolve that conflict. And remember, these are all people who are voicing their opinions. And many times these people are a lot more senior than you. They are very accomplished in their field, just not in scientific communications. So you need to be respectful of that respectfully push back on their opinions. And you have to do all this while maintaining the integrity of the paper and while maintaining submission deadlines, because trust me, nobody wants to be the second one to publish novel research. And this is something that I continue to work at even today. And I chip away at it day after day, hoping to keep improving. 
Now I'd like to wrap up by sharing a few of my key strategies for anyone who is looking to break into medical writing or for that matter, looking to break any conventional mode. So first one is volunteering. Like I said, it is one of the easiest ways for you to figure out what truly excites you and also what where your limitations lie. And um, what I would recommend is in the beginning, volunteer at places that are not so popular, very less known, because it, it's there's fewer competition there and there's less intimidation for you to test out your skills. For example, I had interned at this uh, news website called clapway.com while I was applying for jobs. And um, it's not bound to show up on your news feed, but it helped me get a good writing portfolio. So that's important. Second, remember to highlight some of the non-obvious skills that you've slowly been collecting over your educational uh, journey. For example, your ability to successfully handle multiple projects at the same time is a highly sought after skill in any industry today. Third, networking, which is certainly not a novel strategy, but it's a crucial one. Make sure that you are networking with people who are already at the position that you wanna achieve, but also make sure to network with people who are at the same stage as you are. And who are going through similar struggles, looking to break into a new field. And you'd actually be surprised to, to learn how much you can learn from these, your own peers. Lastly, I'd like to leave you with this one thing. It is okay to not be sure. I certainly wasn't. There are very few things in life that are irreversible. So go ahead and take that plunge. And I'm here to help you in any way I can. That's a QR code of my LinkedIn profile, the best way to reach me. So feel free to reach out. Thank you very much and all the very best. Thank you, Aparna. That was some great insight into the field of medical writing and by extension, I guess, scientific communication. Um, I really liked a lot of the points that you made, but one thing that stood out is how you repackage your non-obvious and existing skills, you know, to um, actually convince uh, people who are hiring you um, in a path that might not be a natural progression of your current degree or your current job. So um, I think that's, that's a really good key takeaway. And I think one other thing that I think really um, helps is that being from a different background than your competition, um, that is actually exciting because you might bring in a lot more new skills that you know your existing competition might not. So um, very, very, very uh, interesting talk. All right, so let's move on and uh, hear from Yutika. And then uh, after that, we will transition to the Q&A. Yutika, it's all yours. Sure, hi. So I'll share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Great. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yotika, and I'm really excited to be in, to, to meet all of you. Um, yeah, I, ICT really means a lot to me, so I'm, I'm glad I have a chance to connect with my alma mater again. Um, so um, yeah, so uh, so I'll let me begin with. Uh, my journey and tell you a little bit uh, about myself and what I do as I go along. So uh, I graduated from ICT with a BTEC in food engineering and technology in 2012. Uh, and afterwards, I decided to get my master's in business administration from Symbiosis. There, I was selected for a dual degree program with Berlin School of Economics and Law, and which is why I uh, ended up spend spending a year in Germany to do my master's in strategic management. Um, I came back to India to work for a company called Omni Active Health Technologies. I was there, I worked there as a management trainee and a product manager for a couple of years. And then I decided to get a PhD. Uh, I got my PhD in strategy and entrepreneurship, which is a subfield within management. My research focus was on social and environmental impact through businesses. And now I graduated very recently, just a couple of months ago. And now I'm currently working for uh, the Imperial College London uh, within a research center called Leonardo Center for Business for the Society. Uh, 
So this was my journey in a nutshell. And if you're anything like me, uh, most of this has made very little sense to you. And you're wondering what I did and why I did that. Uh, you're totally confused. So don't worry, this was just a trailer. And I'm going to take you through uh, what I actually do and what I did at different points in life. So uh, let me begin with who I actually am and a little bit about my actual journey stuff that's not visible on my CV. Uh, so um, I'm very passionate about sustainability. What I mean by sustainability is uh, uh, trying to fulfill the needs of today without compromising the needs of tomorrow, both in terms of the livelihoods of, the pe of people, uh, the needs of the society, as well as the natural environment. So this is something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, apart from that, I'm also uh, very, in, I'm also a literature and language junkie. So I speak more than six languages fluently. And I say more than six because some languages are not uh, very different from the others. So I put them under the same umbrella. And I also like watching a lot of movies. Um, who doesn't, right? So yeah, so that's that's a little bit about me. And uh, at different points in time, different things influenced me. So back in 2004, uh, there was a movie called Swades. Most of you were probably quite young at that point. So this was a movie that uh, really instilled in me, um, you know, the meaning of impact about what it means to do something that actually makes a difference to other people's lives. Um, and at the same time, I was very interested in food as a product I saw food as something which is like the most fundamental need of mankind. And that was probably, to me, it seemed like a way of making a difference to lives of people. And that's how I ended up in ICT to pursue food engineering and technology. Soon, uh, another movie called Zindagi Na Milegi Dobara released. And there I was really uh, uh, struck by the character of uh, played by Ritik Roshan, uh, not because he was a stockbroker and made a lot of money, but because he was he was a polyglot. He spoke many languages fluently and had a very travel intensive profession. And I was like, wow, I, I want that. Uh, and I also knew that this that was something I could do because um, back in my school days, I was the All India level topper for Hindi and French both. And I had won many uh, awards for uh, for English language for my school. So I knew this was something that I was capable of doing, and I also enjoyed it so much. Um, that's why I decided to get an MBA in international business. Um, and then I, I was working in the corporate world for a couple of years when I watched the movie Tamasha, which uh, symbolized about do, doing something for one's own passion, being true to what one really wants to do. And that's when I decided that, okay, I want to do something that's, you know, related to sustainability, related to social and environmental impact. And that's why I decided to get a PhD in business because that was also my previous background. I joined the University of North Carolina to do research in strategy and entrepreneurship. And I chose this university because it seemed to provide an avenue for me to do something related to entrepreneurship, social impact and related topics. And close to the point where when I was close to graduating with a PhD, I wanted to do all of this. I wanted to, to do something that could help me make a difference, something that will allow me to travel, meet people with different cultural backgrounds, and also do something that uh, would make a difference to the society, to the national environment. Um, of course, there were times when I was wondering whether I'll actually be able to do all of this uh, in one profession. Uh, but somehow things worked out and I ended up doing this postdoctoral position uh, that I'm currently pursuing. So maybe all of this, all of my journey makes a little more sense to you now. So this is what I did in terms of my academics and in terms of my professional work. But apart from the main uh, educational program that I was pursuing, I also did a bunch of things that uh, led to an another and that uh, helped me along the way. So when I was doing my BTEC, I tried to do as many different internships as I could. So I interned at a bunch of places and I realized that, you know, maybe a job in quality assurance or R&D was not something that I would want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, being, uh, being, being good at languages was something that I was passionate about. So I made sure that I cultivated those skills. And then when I was doing my MBA, I decided to, again, try to do as many projects as I could to get a feel of what kind of a job I might get after my, uh, after my MBA. So I again interned for a lot of other projects at the same time, uh, working on my linguistic abilities. Uh, when I came back to India, I, 
I, I, I was working as a product manager, but again, I did a bunch of things. So I was associated with a lot of early stage startups. I was also on the editorial board of the UDCT newsletter, uh, UDCT Alumni Association newsletter called Udan. And I also uh, networked a lot. I tried to meet people, not just with my uh, related to my own profession, but also outside my professional and my work. Uh, I also ended up creating an informal network of job seekers because I was on the editorial team of uh, Udan and I had a chance to get to meet a lot of um, recent graduates from ICT or people who were looking to be to graduate from ICT who were in the need of jobs and I tried to help them out through my network. Um, during my PhD, um, I had a chance to do qualitative research, which is one of the very uh, less conventional things in terms of research. So 95% of the people who do research do quantitative research, which involves a lot of statistics and regressions and analysis. I'm one of the 5% minority people who does qualitative research. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what qualitative research is about uh, in, in the next slides. So this was the time when uh, I got exposed to doing qualitative research and I also learned about what is policy making. Uh, I had an offer from the African Development uh, Bank at some point, which I, I chose to decline so that I could complete my PhD. But that was when I learned about what policy making is and how people go about creating policies that uh, influence the decision of countries and governments to say, for example, uh, uh, you know, identify the carbon credit rating of a certain country, carbon trade units and things like that. That was what really excited me. And I wanted to be a part of something that's uh, that deals with policy making. So my postdoctoral job involves some of that. So I'm currently working on initiatives that are led by the United Nations and the World Bank. I'm also consulting to some multinational companies to help them improve their social and environmental impact. I conduct field experiments and qualitative research, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, later. And uh, I'm also working for a nonprofit which is based out of which um, is operational in Rwanda in East Africa. And I'm also associated with Spark and I'm still continuing to develop my language skills because it's also an important part of my job. So this was about my journey and what I have done. You might wonder that there are a lot of different things I did, things that seemed very unrelated to my role, like, you know, speaking French or developing German language abilities that actually seemed very irrelevant to me at some point but if you look at it now it actually has been tremendously helpful in my research career even some of the other things like you know doing the internships or building an informal network of job seekers that has helped me to collect uh, collect data for research get to meet people build my own data sets and use that for my uh, for my dissertation and for my postdoctoral work. So the point I'm trying to convey is that, you know, nothing really goes waste. If you're doing a few things right now, you may question the purpose of it, but you will eventually find an answer to that and things will fall in place together at some point. So a little bit about what I actually do in my current job. So like I mentioned, I'm a qualitative researcher and I do field, -based, uh, field experiment based research. What does qualitative research mean? Um, most research, like I said, is driven by numbers, driven by statistics. Qualitative research is driven by words and thoughts and observations around you. So I meet people, I interview them, try to understand what do they do in their daily lives and what does that lead to? I try to build cause and effect relationships based on the observations and uh, insights that I get from real people. And what are field experiments? So you guys do experiments in your laboratory and you deal with chemicals and substances. Field experiment is something similar, except that my subjects are not uh, chemicals or substances. These are real people operating in real societies, people who have life of their own. So that makes it a little challenging because you're working with people. Um, yeah, but it's also very exciting because you get to see how different things work in, in different settings. So that's about my uh, work. Um, I study social and environmental problems such as you know, food security or uh, climate, uh, climate change, gender inequality, poverty, and things like that. And I study how, how business organizations can make a positive difference through their action. Sorry. Yeah, so some of you might be familiar with the United Nations Framework of Sustainable Development Goals. 
Uh, so the UN has identified some major problems that the world is facing today. My job is to understand them, see what is causing those problems, and the dif and find out the different areas where businesses can make a difference on these issues. So basically, I find different uh, ways to improve the positive impact, and I also assess the impact to make sure that there's actually something happening uh, material to these pro problems. So for example, if if there's a company that's creating a certain amount of social impact and it's also profitable to some extent, I identify the different processes and practices that can, that can help to optimize both its impact as well as profitability. Because profit is also important, otherwise the organization is not going to last. So this is an overview of what I do. Uh, and I work on projects funded by the UN, World Bank and other uh, international institutions and corporations. So what it looks like. So when I describe my job to some of my friends, they, they tell me that, oh, wow, you get to travel so much and you get to meet people from different fields and different walks of life. Um, you're able to hone different skills and enjoy different life experiences. You're, you're able to grow professionally and personally. This is what is apparent to most people around me. Um, yes, it is true. Um, and enjoy, I totally enjoy all of it. But that's not the whole picture. That is only the, the, the tip of the iceberg, which is like about 10% of what you can see and 90% of it is not visible to most of the world. So one of the questions that we got from our registrants was that, when did you realize this was the thing you always dreamt of doing? Uh, it was when I got the support, to be very honest, it was when I got some support and validation from my advisor, who is an expert in the field of uh, social law entrepreneurship, and he's also a qualitative researcher to some extent. So when I got validation from him, that's when I felt that, okay, maybe I can actually do it and I'll probably be successful if I continue doing this. But like I said, that is only the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on which are not very visible. So, you know, you might think that I'm living the life of Ranbir Kapoor from Ye Jawani Hai Diwani, but uh, not all the time. There are times when I'm, uh, you know, really lost about what I'm doing, what's going on. And that is the point at which I want to answer another question from one of the registrants. What are the major challenges and struggles? Uh, there are plenty of them uh, because, and these are challenges that might be associated with anything where you have to break a convention, where you leave your path and move to a different path. So for example, um, there are a lot of professional risks and uncertainties because you're competing with a larger set of people. Uh, there might be times when you're, you find difficulty in uh, learning a certain number of skills. That's because it's hard to be good at everything. You know, We are only human. Uh, failures and rejections, plenty of them and all the time. Racist remarks, uh, cultural shock and fatigue, visa and immigration hassles, uh, scams, loneliness and homesickness, personal issues, all sorts of things happen that are, you know, sometimes not visible. And I wanted to, uh, all of you to be aware of such challenges that come uh, when you take a step outside your outside the mainstream of activity. Um, and that's why I began the slide with the picture of a fish out of water, because that's often how um, one can feel when they break a certain convention. Um, sometimes I wonder whether going through all of this is really worth it. Uh, but you know, that's the Archimedes principle. You have to displace an equal amount of water to stay afloat. Um, and that's why we have um, an adage in Marathi which says, Fatah melia shiva swarg disat nahi. You have to die if you want to see the heaven. Or in the words of Sahir Ludhyanvi, Hazar chan sitaro ka khun hota hai, to ek subah fizaon mein muskurati hai. So that's pretty much the reality of uh, what my actual journey has been like. A bit about the opportunities, because uh, we had a lot of questions related to career opportunities and avenues for fresh graduates. So that's something that I wanted to talk about. So um, yeah, so I wanted to share some opportunities and some career avenues that you can consider. Uh, but this is not an exhaustive list by any means, and I'm not an expert in each of these areas. These are just some avenues that I know exist. Um, and again, I don't claim to be an expert, and my purpose is just to show you that there are opportunities beyond uh, beyond jobs in, uh, in R&D or marketing and sales or quality and things like that. So um, 
being from foods background, I'm going to talk a little bit about opportunities related to foods first. So there are people, uh, there, there are uh, companies and there are organizations that require people who are experts in nutrition and food security. Food sustainability and climate change are other major issues that are coming up. Agricultural sub agriculture and supply chain uh, is, uh, and, and its impact on the livelihoods of people is another uh, field of knowledge that you can pursue. Um, because more than 70% of the world's people are associated with the agriculture and farming activities. So studying how you can make a difference to the lives of these people is another area where there's a lot of demand. Um, when it comes to pharmaceutical sciences, there'll be other people who would know about, thing, uh, about this topic much better than me, but there are a lot of opportunities related to public health, uh, affordable treatments, access to medic, uh, medical equipment, and so on. Health informatics is another place in which uh, you try to gather as much data about people as possible in order to address their healthcare needs better. And there are other chemical uh, field, other fields related to chemical technology, such as clean energy, responsible manufacturing, recycling, clean water, and so on. So these are some of the topics that uh, that that are uh, present, and how you can go about pursuing them, and what kind of jobs you might end up doing. So academia is one way to go about pursuing uh, these, these topics. So for example, you could consider uh, pursuing higher education through business, uh, public health, public policy, sociology, economics, and so on. And thereafter, you can find opportunities within academia itself. So you could be in, uh, associated with teaching or research. There are opportunities related to policy making and think tanks. And this is something that I did not know when I was uh, pursuing my uh, BTEC at ICT. So there are uh, government departments such as the Food Safety and Standards uh, Authority of India or USDA that require people with such background. Uh, think tanks is another space. Now think tanks are organizations that do research, which is provided to governments and to international agencies. And based on this research, organizations frame their policies and rules and regulations. So for example, there's Observer Research Foundation in India, there's United Nations University, which is a think tank that provides research for the UN. There's World Resources Organization, International Food Policy Research Institute, and so on. And, the, and of course, there are international agencies like the United Nations and its several wings, like the Food and Agricultural Organization, World Health Organization, and so on. And the third area of opportunities uh, are the industries or the main, mainstream for-profit companies. So within this space, you could consider doing something at consulting firms such as Accenture, BCG, McKinsey. Each of these organizations have a sustainability wing where you could work. Multinational corporations such as PepsiCo have a corporate social responsibility wing. And there are a lot of startups or social enterprises that come up with uh, the aim to pursue certain uh, social or environmental missions. So these are some of the places where opportunities lie. Um, if you decide to pursue something that's unconventional, um, there are certain things that I would suggest that uh, you know one keeps in mind. Be aware of a few things. So firstly, that, like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of risks and uncertainties. You'll have competition from experts within the field and that's a field that's relatively new to you. Uh, there can be fluctuation jobs of, in the jobs and sometimes jobs are non-permanent by their very nature in these fields. Uh, you could feel like a fish out of water because everyone has limitations in terms of their skills. Uh, you might not see a clear path ahead of you and you might not even have an ideal to follow. Uh, soft skills and cultural differences become all the more important. And when I say cultural differences, I'm not just talking about differences from say India to the US, et cetera. Uh, even within different fields, there are uh, cultural differences. For example, food science people have a different way of operating as compared to business people. And sometimes communication is implicit, sometimes it's explicit. Sometimes people are more achievement oriented, but whereas other times they care more about uh, a balance between work and personal life. People can be individualistic or they can have a more collective approach to work and so on. Uh, remember that no effort, effort goes waste. And it might seem hard, but it is not difficult to turn back. And it's it's okay to fail and not excel. There's, all, there's almost always a chance to uh, go back to where you started from, like Aparna described some time earlier. Um, some things, uh, some areas how you can be prepared. 
So talk to students or professionals who are in that field and who are currently doing what you want to do. And that will make you aware of the pros and cons associated with, uh, with the field. Have a safety net. It's always good to have a backup plan. And it's always good to have a personal support system. You know, right now uh, that you are in ICT, I would say, you know, this is the best time to invest in relationships, make friends, and uh, that is going to be your support system. And I have no idea what I would do in life without some of my close friends. Um, have mentors or senior well-wishers who can guide you or who can correct you in, in times when you need them. Develop additional skills. You know, it could be languages, it could be pro programming languages, it could be hobbies, a bunch of things. These things will contribute to your uh, holistic development and it will take you really far. Uh, network, get to meet people from your field and also outside your field and maintain these connections, maintain them. Don't just reach out to people when you need them. Retain those connections because you never know what you might need at certain point in life. So at this point, I'll finally conclude uh, by sharing some last words from me. Believe in yourself, uh, go what you want to do, take a plunge. And um, yeah, all the best. And this is my contact information. Feel free to you know, take a screenshot of this if you want. And uh, you can reach out to me uh, if there's anything that I can talk to you more in detail about, or let me know what you, if you find found this uh, present, my, my talk useful. Um, Yes, so that was about me and thank you for listening and all the best. Okay, now I'm unmuted, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Yutika, thank you. That was a great talk. Firstly, I think you convinced all of us that you're a movie buff uh, by those multiple references during your talk. And I wonder what movie you've been watching recently that will probably tell us what you're doing next. You don't uh, want to go. Uh, but I mean, one of the things I wanted to reiterate is something uh, that I'm guilty of saying, and I think almost every session is no form of knowledge uh, ever gets wasted. So, and then that also ties back to what Aparna was saying, you know, volunteer sample things and that way you will figure out what you like, what you do not like, it'll take you closer to uh, where you want to be. And then I also really appreciated uh, how you openly and uh, very honestly listed the challenges that you faced or are facing because, you know, you often uh, only hear about the glorious uh, parts of people's lives. You see the trailer, but then there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So hopefully this uh, normalizes uh, some of these challenges and uh, portrays a more real picture to people. So, all right. Uh, thank you. I think we are doing well on time as well. So uh, a reminder for everyone, uh, we'll be taking questions through pigeonhole. So you can use the QR code that is flashing on the screen or go to www.pigeonhole.at and enter the code 17JUL21. You'll also find these details in the chat box. So, all right. We already have a few questions, so we can get started with the first one. Any tips on finding mentors in areas that you do not have a lot of seniors or alumni from your institute working in? That's a good question. Uh, Yutika, Aparna, anyone wants to take a stab at this first? Um, I can share something from my experience. So, uh, yes, this has happened to me a lot of times. And, you know, that have, I have what I have done is I've blindly messaged people on LinkedIn, which if I find their work to be interesting, I just send a request on LinkedIn and I write a short message, like a customized message for that individual, for that specific topic. Uh, and yes, the success rate is usually not high out of every 10 messages that I write to people, only two are answered. And out of those two, maybe one person will actually be in a position to help me and to tell me stuff that I really need to know and stuff that will make may be helpful. So LinkedIn is usually the best um, option available to you. Or maybe, you know, even if you know someone who's not in the area of your interest, if you find someone in a related area, reach out to them and they might know someone who would be a better uh, mentor or a better senior for you. So that's, that's how uh, my experience has been. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, from my experience, LinkedIn has been very helpful. And uh, by that, I mean that LinkedIn 
I had to send so many invites. Those in mails is what I typically send. And uh, you have to take some effort to craft that message to them, something that catches their eyes. Um, and these are very busy people. And another, another medium you could try, and this applies particularly to scientific communication or medical writing, is that oftentimes these people who write blog posts or articles, their names appear at the end of the article and they have contact information. They're usually working at a news desk or something like that. And if you can reach out to them using that contact information, that's another avenue you could try. And like Yutika said, that's also very low success ratio. So it's a numbers game. You got to keep trying that. Another one, another possibility is to, there are a lot of these meetups that show up in, on even on LinkedIn where regional, like where you're, where you live, there are a lot of meetings going on of bloggers meeting up or scientific writers meeting up. So if you show up to such a talk or a meetup and you can go talk to that person live, that's one of the easiest ways. Listen to their talk, pay attention, pick out something that you really enjoyed from their talk and then use that as a, as a thing to start the conversation. So try doing that as well. Thank you. I mean, definitely agree. I think LinkedIn is uh, uh, the best resource we could all use. And uh, also, I, I strongly advise people like both speakers said, please include a short personalized note, even when you are sending a LinkedIn request to people, it makes a huge difference rather than just sending a request alone. All right, uh, let's take this one next. So according to you, what should be the first step for the initial one, two years for a fresh graduate? Uh, who wants to pursue a career in sustainable development. So uh, I believe this one's targeted to Yutika. So I'll let her answer that. Sure. So, uh, okay. So the first steps for the first one or two years, uh, my honest suggestion would be that probably you need a higher uh, education degree after your BTEC in BTEC or BKMNG or BFARM. Uh, there's nothing related to sustainable development that, you know, most of the stuff that we are taught in our undergrad is not related to sustainable development. So higher education is probably something that is prob is your best way forward. Uh, you could consider doing a master's in public policy, health policy, or environmental sciences, something like that. And then see whether research excites you or not. If research excites you, then you could consider doing a PhD or you could uh, you know, not do research and pursue something which is more managerial or operational. So that is one, uh, one, one option that you could do through um, higher education. You could think of jobs directly, but that might be difficult at this point, uh, realistically speaking. Um, you could consider uh, you know, applying for positions at organizations like Observer Research Foundation to, to get a field of things like that, or to apply to nonprofits. Uh, work, work for analysts in certain uh, uh, certain consulting firms and something like that. Um, work experience could be one thing, but I would say higher education is your best bet. Uh, and Yutika, I mean, I am aware that many of these courses that you alluded to are a thing in the US. I'm not sure if that also applies to Indian institutes. Could you clarify if that is the case or if not, how does it change if you're in India? Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, in, in US, these things are very well popular, very popular, uh, very well recognized and re re reputed. Unfortunately, in India, these fields haven't evolved so much. But having said that, I do know that places like um, uh, Institute of, uh, sorry, Indian School of Business Hyderabad or IIM Calcutta, they do have people who work as research assistants for these topics. Uh, and I think they are trying to start uh, educational programs related to uh, related to sustainability. I think I am Ahmedabad was uh, working on some doing something like that. Don't quote me on this. I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, but yes, I remember uh, you know applying for uh, jobs in such places and then uh, finding out that actually that these organizations are doing something in these areas. So um, again, I'm, I'm not the best person to talk about these because I don't know, but I know that there are some places, few, but there are places like ISP, IM Calcutta, IM Ahmedabad that do offer uh, courses that might be related. Sounds good. That was helpful. Uh, all right. Does any question stand out to you from this? I can take that. Um... When did you realize this was a thing you always dreamt of doing? I know you sure. conveyed that in her talk. Uh, 
so to be honest there was no time that 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 idea crystallized in my mind i just enjoy doing what i do and every once in a while i take i take a step back and i ask myself the question do i still want to do what i want to do and it's it's an active process so the day that the answer is a little unsure or no i know that i will start to look at other things i could do so that's the answer and and i hope if someone has experienced that that this resonates with them because things did not appear very clear to me um uh, so, something i think i heard uh, on a podcast podcast recently was if it's not a hell yes it's a no so i think you <laughs> over time i think you start trusting your intuition and gut whatever that is and you, you just know when it's a no uh, yeah, that's nicely put uh all right maybe we'll take this one so what are some skills you gained during your studies that uh, help you in your job today so happen if you want to start with this one i know both of you kind of uh, hinted at uh, these things but maybe if you could uh, restate that crisply again sure so writing is something that i that's number one that the more different types of articles i wrote so review article is entirely different from uh, the way you would write a scientific publication which is got a very standard results methods uh, conclusions um so that's some, something i learned during my phd another skill that i learned and this is during masters as well as phd is putting yourself out there your data you're putting it out there and you're explaining that this is the conclusion i drew from this data and others don't necessarily agree with you and so they will have questions and they'll be like okay hold on a second this could also mean this why didn't you conclude why didn't you go in that direction or why didn't you do this experiment and you only learn that by making mistakes and you sometimes all you can do is admit yes i that was my limitation i should have thought of that but this is what i did so the more you do that you also start to anticipate how somebody from outside would look at this and how they would critique it and that that type of critical thinking helps me now when i am evaluating someone else's experiments and i'm trying to figure out how to communicate that what would it look like on a poster and i i try to be that outside viewpoint for my company's r and d team so i think those two key, key skills really help me in my job even today nice that you, was yutika that was well summarized yeah yutika any insights on this yeah so uh, technical skills obviously they definitely help your knowledge and your knowledge in the domain but one thing that uh, um, one skill that really helped me and this is a skill that i learned at ict uh, i did not have a very good relationship with some of the faculty members and that was when i learned how to you know try to build a rapport with people uh, basically kaise kisi ko baatli mein utarna and there's no way to translate this in any other language uh yeah how to like maybe strike the right chord with people when you talk to them in a certain way uh in a way that is that that it ends up in a mutually helpful relationship soft skills is something that i would really emphasize uh, at this point because uh, that's that's really important to me both as a qualitative researcher and as someone who has to uh, who's at an interface between academia and industry it's really it's important to get to know what the other person wants to hear and uh, frame your conversation in a way that's attractive to them that is something that uh, is is very useful for me thank you so i know we are at the r so what we can do we will have an informal town hall with the speakers so if your question was not answered or if you'd like to just chat with them uh, please uh, uh, stay back after we formally end uh, all right so uh just some closing thoughts and uh, one of our next upcoming sessions is in late august so if you are looking to apply for grad school abroad you'll certainly need to uh, write a statement of purpose and it requires some craft so uh, we have a session on how to write a statement of purpose by uh, vishwanathan dalvi and rucha so definitely stay on the be on the lookout for uh, uh, on our social media pages for updates on this session and then just some closing thoughts so thank you so much yutika and aparna for your for sharing your journeys and uh, insights uh, thank you to the spark mentoring team and the ict social media team as well there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to put these uh, sessions together 
and then uh, we would really appreciate if you could share feedback i think even the speakers would like to uh, you know know if what they said really helped you what they did well so please we request it will only take you 20 to 30 seconds and you will see the link in the chat box uh check us out on our website write to us at info.sparkmentoring@gmail.com for any questions feedback anything you would like to see in the future and yeah spread the word so thank you so much for attending and then for those of you who want to stay back for the informal town hall uh we will allow you to unmute, unmute yourselves and then you can use the raise your hand feature if you have any questions